South Africa has a lot going for it economically. It's rich in mineral resources, it's an already diversified economy, and it has a significantly young labor force that can be drawn upon by employers. If the country can implement sensible and sustainable policies, the sky could quite literally be the limit. But of course, discussions rage about the current policy uncertainty that's afflicting the country at the moment. One economist and market analyst says while there are definitely not exact parallels to be drawn, it would be perhaps a good idea for South Africa to look at countries like Venezuela and even Turkey as examples of where the country would not want to end up and that would be to focus on the reasons they got there. I'm joined on the line by Dr. Adrian Saville. He's Chief Executive at Canon Asset Management. So, Dr. Saville, before we get into South Africa's potential to make bad policy mistakes like Venezuela and Turkey, just give us a summary of how Venezuela has reached a situation where it's estimated that its inflation rate will reach a rate of 1 million percent by the end of the year and why it is some 1.2 million Venezuelan citizens have felt the need to leave the country in just the past two years. Well, I think Venezuela is a great uh, example of a country that had its uh, its heart in the right place, but it's hid in another. Um, and what led Venezuela to getting into that circumstance was uh, through the course of the uh, oil price boom, uh, which um, it characterized a lot of the last 10 years, it uh, afforded Venezuela, which is a large uh, oil producer, um, essentially a windfall. And that windfall was used to fund uh, policy initiatives that extended from uh, social welfare and health care all the way through to uh, education, um, uh, welfare benefit reforms, and so on. And these were very, very generous, but were associated with a, an oil price that was um, uh, elevated and simply didn't sustain. And when the oil price collapsed, um, the political promises that had been made in a high oil price time meant that now you had a whole bunch of promises and commitments without the uh, available funding. Mm -hmm. And to fill that uh, oil price hole, the deficit that was left now by the absence of oil dollars, Venezuela started printing money. And in simple economic terms, inflation happens when you have money without any base uh, chasing goods. Mm. And uh, the result today is this tragic, catastrophic uh, hyperinflation that has uh, essentially bankrupted the country. Mm. And what have the social implications been for Venezuelan people such that they need to leave the country? Mm. Well, I mean, you've, uh, you, you've flagged already that out of a 30 million population, a million have left. Uh, I think that that number um, arguably is low. Uh, Venezuelans on social media uh, block their profiles uh, uh, when they've moved into neighboring countries because their families that have stayed home uh, are at risk of being held hostage for a few thousand dollars. Mm. And if you need uh, insulin or an antibiotic, you simply won't get it. Mm. Um, The estimate of the number of children that have died uh, of starvation runs to hundreds of thousands. It truly is a absolute uh, catastrophe uh, of national proportions. Presumably in the process, institutions there have broken down. Well, one of the most obvious institutions is freedom of speech or freedom of the media Mm. um, and your ability to uh, express your uh, objections or protests. So the the consequence has been uh, uh, social media platforms uh, uh, have been closed down, that people act under the assumption that they are being tracked by government or traced by government, followed by government. And uh, anyone who has put up uh, sufficiently bold protest uh, has had that met with, uh, with jail time. And what about Turkey? It's come under a lot of pressure with the Turkish lira sold off to the tune of about Mm. 50% of its value against the U.S. dollar. And its inflation is nowhere near as dramatic as Venezuela's, but it's standing at around 16%. So what are the particular factors that have seen this country slide? Well, I think in the case of Turkey, of course, you know, as you flag, it's a very different uh, story. But uh, Turkey, until actually until as recently as uh, just a few quarters back, was enjoying extremely strong growth. Uh, it then got into a, uh, a political tussle with uh, big economies, most obviously uh, or most notably the, uh, the U.S. economy. Mm. Uh, and for political reasons, sanctions were imposed on Turkey. 
uh, the, the the consequence for Turkey has taken the shape that a lot of the way in which the the economy was funded, the growth, the boom years of of the last uh, few years were funded by borrowing in euro, funded by European banks. Mm. And when the Turkish lira collapses, and let's put this into our language, this would be equivalent to the rand going from 14 to or 15 to to the dollar to 22 to the dollar, and all of your bank borrowing is in dollars, not rands. So your debt has just uh, gone through the roof. Mm. Uh, banks now face a very high risk of not being able to get those loans back, so their balance sheets are now full, filling with non-performing loans. And it means that uh, the collapsing currency is translating into a banking crisis, and that's quickly feeding through to inflation, which at the moment is modest, but looks like it will easily go materially higher. Mm. And, of course, um, you know, independent analysts and uh, world bodies and the United States itself have been encouraging Turkey to raise interest rates. If they do that, Mm. um, how is that going to help them? Because obviously they still owe that money. Well, you know, what the higher interest rate would do is it would put a break on uh, the the extreme market reaction uh, and it's uh, admittedly it is a conventional or what we call a Washington consensus type reaction and it is hard to uh, at first blush see how hiking interest rates is going to help a system that is already under uh, incredible financial pressure but uh, the alternative that they have at the moment is to do nothing and uh, the uh, policymakers in Turkey have chosen not to hike rates, um, or initially chose not to hike rates. Mm. The idea being that if they hike rates, it was uh, a quick way to get uh, political opposition, to get them sort of uh, uh, voted or t- to lose popularity in votes. Mm. But this requires tough policy decisions, and it requires discipline. Uh, higher interest rates would stabilize the banking system, tame inflation, and at least stand some chance of uh, retaining capital. In the absence of higher interest rates, the banking system uh, runs out of, uh, spins out of control. What little capital is left flees the country, mm. and the uh, 50% uh, Turkish lira collapse turns into a 75 or bigger collapse. So now so we, it's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's the lesser of two evils. Mm, no, I hear you. So now we come to South Africa, where our inflation rate is 5.1%. That's within the Reserve Bank's inflation target band, and the rand has depreciated by between 15 and 20% against the US dollar this year. And that's not all due to internal country factors. And while there have been calls Absolutely. for the government to keep a check on its debt levels, a big proportion of that debt is not denominated in foreign currency, like Turkey, for example. So what is it about mm. South Africa that makes you worry that we could head in a similar direction to our country case studies? Well, I think, you know, we need to be careful uh, not to draw uh, too strong uh, a parallel. Mm-hmm. But, but I would venture that they, in each case, they sort of uh, ring some some warning bells. In the case of Venezuela, the most obvious uh, warning bell that is, uh, that is rung is that policy promises uh, are all good and well. They, uh, they point to a rosy future, to desirable outcomes, and make absolutely no mistakes. South Africa needs uh, pointing to uh, a much brighter future. We sit with elevated unemployment, uh, gross inequality, per capita incomes have been stalled for a decade. Mm. But pointing to uh, rosy policy promises is very different to delivering them. Um, And in the case of South Africa, we have uh, a lot of pointing, uh, a lot of, um, uh, I I guess it's sort of uh, agenda driving, that there are easily available outcomes, but when when it comes to delivery and you don't have high oil prices and you've filled uh, uh, the environment with policy promise, you're quickly met with social accident. Mm. Or in and our I case, guess, uh, I was going to say, um, Dr. Saville, or in our case, not high commodity prices because that's been, uh, that's been our sure. factor. Hmm. Yeah. It, it, it has been. Yeah. Um, and in the case of Venezuela, you know, maybe South Africa's equivalent is land. And uh, 
uh, I'm going to say the exact opposite of what I think uh, you know, the, the narrative is right now. The narrative is whatever you do, you know, don't uh, expropriate land without compensation. Mm. Um, if you can put in place the, the right mechanism, South Africa sits on uh, an incredibly valuable uh, resource in the form of underutilized land that uh, uh, can potentially translate into output and balance sheet improvement. Mm. The Turkish story is uh, uh, is a reminder that um, that you're part of a bigger system, um, and at a time when South Africa is trying to attract a hundred billion dollars in foreign investment, mm. you don't want hot money that can leave the way the money has left Turkey. You want the money to come in a uh, level-headed, uh, stable way with high degrees of confidence in in the policy and regulatory environment. Yes. And Turkey, I think, has, has squandered that. South Africa is in pursuit of $100 billion. We can look to Turkey to what not to do. Yeah, I know. I hear you. How tricky is it going to be for South Africa to keep its budget deficit in check, do you, do you think, especially in light of overspending on the mm. public sector wage increases, for example, and, of course, this big push to establish programs like the NHI? NHI is uh, deliverable. Public sector wages are not out of hand if they match with uh, productivity. So, you know, in, good, in good economic fashion, I'm putting qualifiers into your uh, your red flags. Yes. So South Africa has a very bloated uh, uh, public sector wage bill. Um, we can add into this combination the fact that we have a desperate need for infrastructure spending to kickstart the productive sector of the economy. But the SOE coffers are empty. Um, so there's, there's a number of deficit holes that have to be filled. Yeah, I just want to interject there and say it's very tricky, though, isn't it? I mean, um, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, there were headlines about possible uh, job cuts in the public sector and the, the threats that came with it, you know, to the ruling party that, hey, if, if this is the route that you're going to go, um, you know, next year is election time and uh, your voting fodder mm. won't be there. It's, it's just very difficult, isn't it? It's incredibly, incredibly difficult. I think the, the ANC uh, administration sits on the horns of a dilemma. It is a very, very difficult environment to be going into a key election with, uh, with an economy that's on the back foot. In the same breath, I guess, you know, what's required is policy certainty. Um, policy certainty, by definition, you know, like any strategy, requires tough choices. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's what's being, being required here is tough choices about not uh, just that the SOEs need to be refinanced, but how they are refinanced. Uh, the productivity across the public sector uh, is, is a critical uh, lever that has to be pulled. We need to uh, get economic growth kick-started, and that growth needs to be uh, transformative. You can put radically in front of it, you know, if that grabs your political uh, appeal. But what I mean by transformative is that it establishes jobs and it... Uh, it lifts people out of poverty, which by itself then regresses uh, inequality. So mm. uh, these are big asks going into a, a critical election. In your view, do you think South African capital assets are going to remain vulnerable until the outcome of next year's election? Business uh, investors are of all shape and form. I don't think it needs to be South African, but everywhere. Mm. You know, what investors are after is uh, is certainty. And the more certainty and stability you can give them, I guess the better investors sense that they can see uh, uh, further uh, over the next couple of hills. So see here, South Africa, just like land, I think, sits on uh, an incredible potential, and that is our corporate balance sheets. We have uh, an exceptional banking system, uh, world-class financial markets, superb regulations, uh, but investors are anxious. And I think if you can... Uh, a point uh, to clear a policy direction. It's a great way to untrap this uh, this latent potential that sits on corporate balance sheets in the form of uh, of lazy cash. That was Dr. Adrian Saville. He's chief executive at Canon Asset Management.